लोकांना म्युटच रखन पडेल Hi Ajit. Have you admitted to be? Yeah. Sorry. Hello sir. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. Not at all. It's a pleasure. <laughs> I like your new hairdo but I'm not sure about the beard. <laughs> <laughs> You're concealing good features my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Uh... So we're starting bang at three, no? Yes, we start bang at three. Okay. You're in the now Supreme Court permitted attire, sir. Yeah. No, actually, they said bands. I don't know if attire will do. They said that. So I mean, hi. Hey, Rahul. How are you? Hi, sir. I can't see you anyway. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay, great. <laughs> You've seen me enough. Okay. You OD. Hi. <laughs> how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm My old good. friend Mohan. I haven't seen you for ages. <laughs> How are you? Ah, chal raha hai. Living in the COVID world. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. We just heard some news. Heard some news then? Mahesh, good afternoon. I'm Sandeep Junarkar. Hi, Sandeep. How are you? Yeah, I can see. Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah, sir. Now we can see you also. Uh, you're clear. Yeah, absolutely clear. Okay. Where did Mohan go? You were saying something. I said your dad was saying something. He's frozen now on the video. I think maybe his uh, his screen has frozen. He joined in again, sir. It's hanging. Okay. So I'm get you guys. I'm sure would rather be in a wine bar than a webinar. <laughs> 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 no, wait till it starts, then you can go.
So lockdowns on till now. Thirty first. Yes. So end of May. End of May. I suspect end of June, yeah. Maybe, maybe till the time we would be able to control. Two weeks. Two weeks at a time till the end of June. Looks like. Well, numbers are spiking, and we are a little bit of a risk. True. I think we have yet to reach the peak. That could be one of the reasons. Yeah. And they are estimating initially it was May, and now what the news, the grapevine is, it has gone to June or July. So once we reach the peak, and then the downfall will start. That's what the people are saying. So maybe hope for the best. Which grapevine are you listening? To? <laughs> take a switch off. Take it off. Just take it off. No, take off the yeah. Unconnect. Disconnect it. It's three p.m. Should we start, sir? Yeah, I'm all set. All right. I'll just mute everyone else, and um, I'll, I'll keep you um, unmuted, of course, sir. But just give me a moment. Okay. So, <clears throat> welcome everyone to this lovely webinar that we are having this Friday afternoon. And our our guest speaker for this afternoon is, of course, as you all know, Mr. Mahesh Jaitpalani. He's been very, very kind enough to address us on a topic which is close to his heart and which he's an absolute expert in, and a topic that we all as practitioners need to know and um, is not something that we can really learn from reading uh, books or the Evidence Act, but something that we learn and sharpen through uh, our practice. And that is um, the art of cross-examination, Mr. Jaitwalani being a real practitioner, someone who's cross-examined several witnesses, um, will share his guidance, his insight of how to deal with every witness and how to meander through the very, very difficult and sometimes uh, rather tasking um, uh, uh, field of cross-examination. So without uh, further ado, so the mic and the screen is all yours. We thank you once again for, just for all the viewers. Everyone has been put on mute. Uh, if you have any questions, there is a chat box and you can type in and I will respond. Uh, at the end of this, uh, of this talk, we'll have a Q&A session. So anyone who has any questions, again, please type them out and I will ask them to Mr. Jaitmalani on your behalf. Um, and in the middle, if, if, there's any, if there's any problem, just uh, type it in the chat box and I will address it. So on that note, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, lawyers and laymen, when I was first invited for this uh, webinar in your lockdown series, I wanted to speak on a subject that was liberated from the usual drudgery of you know, analyzing Supreme Court decisions, dissecting them, pointing out their subtleties, and reconciling them. Uh, when the subject of the art of cross-examination was suggested to me, I jumped on it. I jumped on it uh, because it was bereft of all these tortuous drudgeries. Um, today's address is therefore bereft of the usual trappings of a law lecture. It is most certainly not for the academic or the scholar. Rather, it is for the practitioner and the aspiring trial lawyer. So the mosaic will be unfamiliar, but I hope it will be refreshing. Now. The original topic given to me, uh, I might add, just as a prelude, was the art of cross-examination. I started doing a little bit of research 
while I started, um, my video is off. While I started doing a little bit of research, I discovered, mainly because of an article written by an American firm in the Harvard Law Review, that cross-examination, the classification of cross-examination as an art was uh, a little faulty. So I told the sponsor that perhaps we should retitle uh, this address. And hence we've got today's current title, which is uh, cross-examination, cross-examination, honing uh, uh, the practitioner's skills. Because really, I don't believe it's an art anymore. I believe it's a skill which has to be acquired. Now, before we go on to the skills required for a cross-examination, what, what a good cross-examiner, uh, how a good cross-examiner cross must prepare, uh, it's important first to determine what the object of cross-examination is. You know, most traditional classical textbooks uh, treat cross-examination as an art. Uh, for instance, one of the most classic treatises on, on cross-examination is Francis Wellman's book, not surprisingly called The Art of Cross-Examination, right? Uh, and the rationale for cross-examination is given as, uh, and it, be, it is the most effective means of extracting truth and exposing falsehood. Now, to me, this appears to be a rather lofty, sanctimonious view of cross-examination. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an idea which is uh, first mounted by a very famous English barrister called Edward Cox. You will find it in most textbooks on cross-examination. Uh, which tried to deal with cross-examination. Uh, Edward W. Cox, the English law, and this is what he said. Cross-examination, the rarest, the most useful, and the most difficult to be acquired of all the accomplishments of an advocate. It has always be, been deemed the surest test of truth and a better security than the oath. So, the art of cross-examination or if you, if you can call it an art, has been put on a pedestal, right? It's, a, you know, there's a lofty ideal behind it that it's really a tool for unraveling the truth. Now, this is baloney, actually. Right? Lawyers don't really wield the weapon of cross-examination in trial to unearth the truth. No, lawyers, more often than not, they defend guilty people in criminal cases and a party who could be wrong in civil ones. If two adversarial lawyers only function was a quest for truth, they would hardly be adversaries. Lawyers fight cases to win. Truth be damned. We serve our clients and we want to enhance our reputations by winning cases and especially un unwinnable ones. Of course, the reputation for winning is to be burnished by winning fairly we must not fabricate evidence, suborn witnesses. We must be fair to witnesses. We must be polite to our worthy opponents. And most of all, we must be respectful and polite to courts. The truth, however, is not our business. The truth is to be discovered by the judge on the basis of evidence produced by both sides. It is the beholden duty, in fact, of the cross-examiner to demolish a witness of the other side, if he can do so, even if he knows the witness is telling the truth. Now, one of the articles I read really uh, when I was researching this subject, and, and you know, that's a theme which I developed. Uh, it, it's worth reading. I'll give you the, the bibliography at the end. Cross examination is like a sporting event, a contest between two sides competing to win under a set of rules enforced by a neutral third party. That's the real idea of cross-examination. The famous author Phipson, you probably all read of Phipson on evidence or heard of him at least, right? The famous author Phipson put it most succinctly. I think he was right. He got it best. For him, he says, the object of cross-examination is twofold. And none of this hogwash about truth and discovery of truth and all these lo lofty ideals. According to him, the object of cross-examination is twofold. To weaken, qualify, or destroy the case of the opponent. 
and secondly to establish a party's own case by means of his opponent's witness witnesses which bring me to the question then how do you go about doing it and is cross examination an art or a science as i said before most books on cross examination refer to it as an art this is misleading because it suggests that skillful cross examination is an innate virtue it somehow inheres in people almost like it's embedded in his dna moreover art can hardly be taught at most you can have classes for art appreciation so art can be taught to be appreciated right but art itself can never be taught practitioners who attempt to cre- to teach cross examination end up only presenting good examples of cross examination but they can't teach you how to become a good cross examiner that requires certain other virtues and qualities is cross examination then a science there are indeed authors who refer to cross examination as a science so according to the famous american authors who wrote the book on cross examination ponzer and dodd for them cross examination is a science it has firmly established rules guidelines identifiable techniques and definable methods now of course there is rational and method in cross examination but does this by itself qualify cross examination to be a science the notion that it does implies that there's a fixed formula for being a good cross examiner but cross examination is far more than that there is charisma there's flair even flamboyance creativity impromptu brilliance instinct and thinking on one's own feet these are nurtured and inspired only in the courtroom by the inspiration awarded afforded by keen judges worthy opponents watching peers the media glare and thronging crowds which open courtrooms public trials uh, afford in this country and most countries there are many qualities therefore in a cross examiner that cannot be created in a laboratory hence it is not a science so we come back then to the notion which i told you earlier actually interested me when i was researching this address the notion of cross examination as a competitive sport being played out before an impartial referee of course justice is far more important than a trophy or an award but still a trial is a heated contest between two sides fighting tooth and nail to win and nowhere is that com- competition more intense than in the field of cross examination thus while both science and cross examination may reveal the truth the truth is not what the cross examiner is after the cross examiner seeks above all a victory for his or her client so cross examination is a sport accurately captures the craft as something more most lawyers can do something most lawyers can do but few can do well and almost none perfectly almost none perfectly most of all sport provides guidance as to how lawyers can become better at cross examination so we need only to look at how sportsmen succeed in sports see there are three subheadings here one sportsmen practice the proper, proper technique first to become good and excel in the area secondly they prepare intensely for a game and third and very important this is probably the most important they make good decisions during the game a skillful cross examiner his essence has got to be his mastery over the craft has to be mental agility and thinking on his feet all right so what do you mean first by the first of these headings practicing the proper technique frankly the only way a lawyer commencing his practice 
can acquire the skills of a good cross examiner is by watching experienced trial law lawyers wield their craft. So, and when they start getting, yeah, and when they start, there is some request from people to uh, speak a little louder. I think the, the voice is a little, a little low. No, I got okay. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever heard that, but yeah, I'll scream. Maybe the computer doesn't translate your voice well enough. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. The only way a lawyer starting practice is that better? Just tell me, just tell me when I'm voluble enough, right? I push it a little closer. The only way a lawyer starting practice can acquire the skills of a good cross examiner is by watching experienced trial lawyers engage in their craft. When they start getting briefs as juniors, practice the craft as often as they can. They must plead, implore their seniors to at least initially let them cross-examine. And I, seniors must be indulgent in this. I'm very indulgent to my juniors. I give them a lot of scope when I get a trial matter to cross-examine. So at least minor witnesses, juniors should be keen to take it up, not shy away from it, not be hesitant, not be uh, unsure of themselves. And seniors must encourage them at least to start to get a feel of the course with minor witnesses and under their guidance and supervision. That's very important that these minor, minor witnesses also, which are handed over to juniors, can be guided, can be under the guidance and supervision of an indulgent senior. Therefore, the proverb that practice makes perfect and Julius Caesar's famous words, experience is the teacher of all things, never rung truer than when applied to cross-examination. Preparing thoroughly. Now, of course, this is pre-entering the arena, right? When you're getting ready, like sportsmen do. So preparing thoroughly. One is, the first one is improving with practice your technique till you reach a high degree of excellence. Second is preparing thoroughly. A lawyer without cross-examination skills is but half a lawyer. A cross-examiner weaves his magic with facts. An experienced and pro proficient cross-examiner will over the years always come on an easy mastery of facts in any case that he does. This is the great value of cross-examination. Once you, it is so concerned with facts and so little law, right? Except how to come get over uh, absurd objections by your opponent, right? Most of the time, that's, that's the area of law we are dealing with or how to prove documents which may otherwise be inadmissible. The most important is complete mastery over the facts of a case. In criminal cases, you must therefore read the entire chart sheet page to page or a complaint if it's a private complaint and all the accompanying documents. Do not be lazy about this. Do not, sh do not shy away from what you might think is a casual document, unimportant in its probative value. Read the entire thing. And I, in, in, in civil trials, and I've done several of them, you must have a mastery of the entire pleadings and all the documents which are exchanged during uh, uh, discovery and inspection or by production. So you must have a complete mastery of the facts. Then you must ponder, having read all these documents, don't stop there. Ponder and introspect deeply about them. What does that mean? This is not just verbosity. That means you must see the evidentiary value of each witness statement and every document that you have perused and which is sought to be proved by the other side. Then classify the evidence against your client in two, in two classifications. First is whether it's direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or corroborative evidence. Second classification is you have to then see what their weight is, their probative value and their weight, and rank them in importance of weight, which are more weightier and which are less weightier, and which really, some of which have no probative value at all, right? By this exercise, you know who are the most important witnesses against you. Therefore, you also know whom to cross-examine extensively, though carefully, whom you have to cross-examine minimally and whom you can ignore altogether. The next task during preparation is to draft questions. 
Now, when I say draft questions, there's a lesson here, an important hint here. And you must not stick to a prepared script. Certainly, draft questions. But as in when you draft questions, you should consider every possible answer to those questions which you have drafted. It's not that you're going to get a stereotype response from, a, from every witness. So think about the possible responses, every possible responses that you can conceive of. Now, all this is an arduous task and many people don't do it. But if you really want to master cross-examination and be a cross-examiner par excellence, this is a very, very important task because that will help you think on your feet. You're, you're one step away from thinking ably on your feet to, uh, to, to questions when you have anticipated in advance the different responses possible to a question posed by you. Then consider what you will do in response to each of those answers. So having thought of all the possible responses to each of your question, see how you will deal with each of the possible answers. We come now to the third quality of a good cross-examiner and a, a sports person who excels. Actual cross-examination and what I said is a key to becoming a proficient cross-examiner. Making the right decisions. First, throughout your cross-examination, this is very important, and I found that when I don't, my witness gets a little emboldened. Never take your eye from any material witness from the time his chief commences. Don't take your eye away from him. Glare at him, stare at him, make him as uncomfortable as you can. He must know you are watching his every word. It's disconcerting for him. Do that constantly. Don't get distracted by things external to what is going on. Watch every expression of the witness's face and his entire bearing because demeanor, his demeanor will inform you of his general integrity or his weakness on cert at least certainly on some certain aspects of his case. Even if it's an idea of general integrity and sometimes while he's giving evidence, you're watching him, he will falter. You will make out from his wavering tone that this guy is a little, a little unsure of his feet on this area of his deposition. Now, there are two types. Point number two. There are two types of cross-examiners. One is the aggressive one who attempts to intimidate, intimidate witnesses from the very outset. He goes there trying to browbeat them, intimidate them, and sort of wear them down into submission. And then there's the polite, calm one who seeks to disarm them and coax out the answers he seeks. Now, there are very few lawyers who can carry off pure aggression from the outset to the end of their examination, cross-examination. For one thing, it requires tremendous amount of charisma and personality and an acquired reputation for destroying witnesses. I mean, people who want to do this kind of thing, you know, they have to walk in court and people say, oh my God, the witness is going to, you know, tremble when he, when he enters. So at an early stage, without an acquired reputation, without lots of experience, this kind of, you know, lawyer who strikes terror is difficult. It is much better. And even, even later on in your years, you can't be exclusively an aggressive, intimidatory lawyer. You have to, you have to sometimes coax, sometimes bully. But in, your, in the earlier stages of your trial career, be polite, be calm, and coax out with great dexterity the answers you seek from your witness. One of the greatest cross-examiners of all times, I may mention in passing, was Sir Charles Russell, who is considered as a legend on both sides of the Atlantic. He later became uh, uh, Baron Russell of Killowen and then died in 1901 as the Lord Chief Justice of England. He was a formidable, he's known to be one of the best cross-examiners of all time, acknowledged both in America and in the, and, and the UK. Of him it was said, so he could do this, of him it was said that he produced the same effect as a witness that a cobra produces on a rabbit. 
Russell's own maxim for cross examination. Russell's own maxim for cross examination was, go straight at the witness and at the point. Throw your cards on the table. Mere finesse, mere finesse. You know, subtlety. Juries don't appreciate. Now, it's true that juries consist of laymen, and you know, for the pressure and and the trouble of having been pressed into jury service. They don't want part of the part of the relief that they get in a court is that they want to see a heated cross examination duel between two opposing lawyers, right? It's like a you know they want to see blood at a gladiatorial battle. They're not there just to render justice. They want something more. After all, they've been forced out of their occupations into jury service. Mercifully in India, mercifully in India, the jury system was abolished with the Nanavati case in the 60s sometimes, and now. The judge is both judge of fact and law. All verdicts are rendered by him. Right? So we don't have to worry about the passions of a jury. We don't have to play to the gallery in this country. We have a sober judge. Most of the time, they are temperate and balanced, and they want calm and equilibrium in their courts. A good trial judge will seek to protect witnesses anyway, and an overtly aggressive cross examiner will be a terrible eyesore. He will, you know, he will, he will, you will put off the judge considerably. So, the aggressive uh, uh, approach to cross examination is not to be encouraged. On the contrary, it is to be discouraged. But of course, if you have the personality, and I know some cross examiners in my lifetime who really had that personality, but nonetheless, they walked in with that reputation of being terrifying as a, as cross examiners, but. They still were very polite with the witness, unless unless they needed to be really firm and they, when they knew a witness was lying or perjuring himself in some way. So a clear caveat to being a clear caveat to being an aggressive cross examiner is when a witness is a lying one, or is intent for reasons of partisanship. To testify against your client, the approach to such a witness is immediately on noticing his partisanship. Immediately, you must, you must, you must set the, you must set the tone at the very outset. The moment you realize this guy has come, you know, to to he's determined to uh, put your client uh, behind bars, or or your or your if you're defending, it's a defendant. Uh, he's determined to to win his plaint the plaintiff's case. Then, the moment you realize that. You have to start demolishing his credibility with your best points. Start with your best points, both on inconsistency, right, and on character. If you have any points on character, so you've got to put him at unease. You've got to show him immediately, right, that he's you're not going to tolerate this. And once you've exposed him, tear him into shreds after he's exposed. Next, in a criminal case, and particularly one involving a serious crime. Never ever ask a question. The answer to which, if against you, may destroy your client. There is no point being too verbose, too prolix. Lengthy cross examination is not skilled cross examination. Such a risk may be taken only when the evidence against your client is so dire, is so overwhelming. That a conviction, for example, is almost inevitable. Then the risk may be worth it. A golden rule is that a lawyer should never ask in cross-examination a, a question unless, in the first place, he knows what the answer is likely to be, or in the second, he doesn't care. So never ask a question. In this is a golden rule. Uh, another famous barrister, Sergeant Ballantyne, an English barrister, in his book *Experiences*, said he quotes an instance. He quotes an instance in a trial, and this is rather interesting, of a prisoner for homicide, where a once famous English barrister had been induced by his attorney. Attorneys, please note, he had been induced by his attorney to, and against his own judgment, against his own judgment. To ask a question in cross-examination, the answer to which ultimately convicted his clients. 
Upon receiving the answer, the barrister turned to his attorney who insisted that the question be asked and said, and said to him, emphasizing every word, emphasizing every word that he said, go home, cut your throat. And when you meet your client in hell, beg his pardon. <laughs> and this is a true story, by the way. It's narrated in Sergeant Valentine's book. On the other hand, when you receive a really, really favorable answer in cross-examination, leave the issue. Don't go fishing further. Don't delve deeper. You pass quietly on to some other issue. You've got what you wanted. You don't have to hammer it home. The chances are that he will dilute it. He'll realize that he's made a horrible admission in your favor and he'll try and dilute it. So just leave it there. Let the issue just drop, period. Do not by any future question, directly or indirectly, give the witness an opportunity to dilute what you have so painstakingly elicited. Then, next, do not ever let a witness ruffle or dominate you. A good advocate should be a good answer, should be a good actor. The greatest of advocates, and this is absolutely true, I've seen, I've I, I, I appeared as a junior to some of them, the greatest of advocates occasionally elicit a damaging answer. But it's their response that makes them masters. This is the time for greatest self-control. A really good trial lawyer will show time that the answer has damaged him. He will proceed smoothly to the next question as if nothing happened. Any show of disappointment in, a, in the face of a damaging answer will impact the judge terribly or a jury if it's a jury trial and it will embolden the witness. He'll think he's got you. So if you get an unfavorable answer, for God's sake, be an actor. Pretend nothing has happened. No matter how much you're hurting inside. All, all lawyers after all, and that's why, and, and cross-examiners more than most other lawyers are all failed actors. So succeed in court. No, nor should the witness be able to provoke the cross-examiner into anger or irritation by evasiveness or sarcasm. At the first attempt at this by a witness, the cross-examiner should put him in his place by his own subtle sarcasm. Right? Let him know who's boss immediately if he is evasive, by pinning him down. I mean, we keep saying maybe this, maybe that, and no yes and no answer. Pin him down immediately and show him who's boss. Caution him that he's under oath to answer honestly and that honesty entails a straight answer and not a babbling obtuse one. If you don't control, if you don't seize control at the earliest when this happens, the witness will ruin your entire cross-examination by obfuscation. I've seen this happen. So you must, you must show him who's boss and the, 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 the whole proceeding of cross-examination must be under the cross-examiner's control. Then as I said earlier, a lengthy prolix cross-examination must be avoided. It serves no purpose except exposing the vacuousness of your case and uh, provoking the irritation of the judge. Do not invite the sarcasm of a judge by lengthy cross-examination. As a cross-examiner in a jury trial in Washington DC did, when well into his lengthy cross-examination, he stopped and said to the trial judge, your honor, the juror is asleep. To which the judge retorted, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. So lengthy cross-examination, unnecessary boring cross-examination is to be studiously avoided. Questions must always be formed with an object in view. Random questions or a fishing inquiry should be avoided as they may let in facts which would damage your case. Don't ask a question for the sake of asking it because apart from boring everybody and not helping your own case, you may permit the witness to say something which you are not aware of, but you're giving him a chance to put in something in addition to damage your client's case. 
so do not just be very careful short terse to the point cross examination is much better don't think that by prolonging it you're going to improve your client's case by getting something by sheer luck or good fortune a famous judge and and never lose your temper when you don't get a favorable answer from a witness in your lengthy cross examination a famous judge baron alderson i'm sure we've all heard of him once told the counsel mr so and so you seem to think and you i'm sure you've all heard this epithet you seem to think that the act of cross examination is to examine crossly not so not true now very important we often make suggestions in cross examination when you are making suggestions in cross examination make them with extreme caution make them with extreme caution those suggestions made in cross examination are not evidence the law in india and i think it's i think it's fallacious law but at some stage the bombay high court judgment by the way not a supreme court judgment at some stage it may have to be corrected the law in india is that those suggestions made in cross examination are not evidence are not evidence such suggestions may be called into aid to lend assurance to the prosecution's case where other evidence has established the guilt of the accused so it has a minor role to play but if the judge feel that the other evidence is sufficient your suggestion a foolish one can be can be used to lend assurance to the judge's view that a prosecution that a conviction is called for so th this is i i believe wrong law but it's there i mean although the weight to be attached as you can see from the proposition i raised i i, I dealt with is extremely minimal it's still there and a, a unnecessary suggestion should not should not be made at all next make sure you challenge make sure you challenge every statement of fact which is material to the case against your client whenever a statement of fact made by a witness is not challenged in cross examination whenever a statement of fact please note is not challenged in cross examination it may be you may think it's innocuous but read everything and at least suggest it is false because if you don't challenge a statement made in deposition on oath in your cross examination it is to be concluded the court will conclude that the fact in question is not disputed by your client so therefore your 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 answer your when you when you finally come to the suggestions in your case right or you want to intersperse it with the rest of you at whatever stage you you deem it fit to come out with suggestions those suggestions must take into account every statement made in his deposition by a witness all of them and you must deny it you must say i deny i deny it is it is denied it is not true it is not true it is not true so that's a very people tend to forget that but if you do you are running the risk of ad, uh, admitting by non denial what has been said i think there are these rules which really go to the actual client thinking on your feet etc um, you know making of a good cross examiner the attributes you must have the demeanor the questions you must ask etc let me now turn to some classes of witnesses who the cross examiner must handle with extreme caution right this just i'm fine tuning it only to think that there may be others uh, but these three came to mind quite readily and therefore a a, a practitioner's caution uh, is necessary one is the eye witness the first is the eye witness see this type of witness comes to court and i dealt with several of them in full knowledge that he is crucial to the outcome of the case and very often he come to the knowledge in a criminal case that conviction itself depends upon his testimony he realizes it is important to the prosecution and sees himself as a vital cog in the course of justice 
often because he's got this self of self importance because he knows the tremendous probative value and weight of his evidence he is willing he is willing to embellish his testimony because he believes it is his calling this i witness has a sense ha has an exaggerated sense of self importance this witness especially in serious criminal cases must be approached with extreme caution how must he be approached and what should be the thrust of cross examination against this type of a witness one if he has not disclosed in his police statement about how he came to be at the scene of the offense then question him if he is a witness by sure chance and people who don't disclose the reasons for being present at the scene of the offense often are chance witnesses right if he is a witness by sure chance then by that very fact his evidence is slightly tainted it is undermined to that extent that he's not a natural witness at the scene of the offense where he claims where he claims to have witnessed the event but is there by sure chance and what would that chance be you can probe him on that you often find that if he's a chance witness he will not be able to account for his presence at the scene of the offense if he is a partisan witness expose him as such you must get into him very fast right the best way to deal with the eye witness who's otherwise good on his facts is to expose his partisanship keep attributing motive to him you must attribute motive to him to falsely implicate you may know he's telling the truth but as i said truth is not your concern winning the case for your client by fair means permitted by the rules of evidence is your goal if he is a partisan witness expose him as such if partisanship is not disclosed in his police statement bring out this glaring omission and suggest he deliberately suppressed it from the police because to suppress your relationship whether it's a one of friendship or a business partner or a family member or a any other you know religious affiliation or whatever all these are vital to be disclosed to a police police officer it's not just it is not just a uh, innocuous omission visit the scene of the offense and if there are any you know i have to tell you one thing i do want to say there's a lot i could say about my father as a cross examiner my the late mr ram jitlani but i'm not going into it because i don't want to be partisan so but i do want to say this that at the age of 80 in in rural maharashtra for for an for an appeal not just a trial for trials he would always do it i I've, i've been to scenes of offenses in, you know in in nasik for instance there was a murder case in Na nasik when i started my career i went with him but he would always insist on going to the scene of the offense right when it was ballistic evidence he would even he would be even more insistent so visit the scene of the offense a good cross examiner must in his mind have a picture of how the crime is supposed to have taken place where the bullet was shot from where the victim stood what is the distance between the two what are the surrounding topography all these facts are of vital importance witness visit the scene of the offense and see if there are any features there which could detract from his eyewitness account determine from his account whether the whether from the place where he allegedly saw the incident he could have actually witnessed the incident and whether the details of his account can be successfully challenged elicit information on circumstances connected with the story but to which he has not already testified this is very important there are circumstances surrounding his story which he might not have either in his police statement or even later on in his testimony he may not have touched upon these you must probe because it is very likely that he would be unprepared for this a witness when he especially in india it has been my observation that in india he is called he is coached and the coaching by the public prosecutor or the police officer right they'll show him a witness statement 
and by and large he will stick to what he said in his statement one of the reasons of course being unfortunately that in india trials take about at least 6 7 years after the episode has taken place so elicit information on circumstances connected with the story but which he has not so far uttered anything either in police statement or in evidence if the incident was at night and i'm coming to an example here if the incident was at night question his ability to witness it in view of the poor light finally elicit all contradictions and omissions if any between his police statement and his testimony in court now an interesting cross examination in respect of an eye witness merits narration and i'll only read a very vital excerpt and 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 the history behind this cross ex examination and it merits narration if only because it occurred in abraham lincoln's first defense at a murder trial when he was a young lawyer i don't know if you knew that abraham lincoln many of you knew you knew that abraham lincoln was a trial lawyer but this is an excerpt from his first defense case as a trial lawyer and it was a homicide case a murder case all right so here's here's the brief factual background all right one grayson one grayson was charged with shooting lockwood one lockwood at a camp meeting on the e evening of august 9th in the 1860s and with running away from the scene of the killing which was witnessed by one sovine now sovine is the eye witness who lincoln cross examined now grayson was the accused lockwood was the victim and sovine was the eye witness that's all we need to do the proof was so strong the proof was so strong that even with an excellent previous character grayson came very near being lynched by a mob by a mob on two occasions soon after his indictment for murder everybody believed that this man should be hanged even before trial he gets to trial because the proof of straws and created an outrage uh, lockwood was an extremely popular man in the locality the mother of the accused after failing to secure experienced counsel finally engaged young abraham lincoln as he was then called and the trial came on for an early hearing no objection was made to the jury and no cross examination of witnesses save the last and important one sovine the eye witness who swore that he knew the parties saw the shot fired by grayson saw him run away and picked up the deceased who died instantly the evidence of guilt and identity were morally certain the attendance was large the interest intense grayson saw him run away and uh, sorry abraham grayson's mother began to wonder why abraham lincoln remained silent so long and why he didn't do something because he, he ignored all the witnesses but as i said the eye witnesses of obviously sometimes the only possible ground for conviction so he waited for his chance the people finally arrested the tall lawyer stood up and eyed the strong witness in silence without books or notes and began his defense by these questions lincoln and you were with lockwood just before and saw the shooting witness yes and you stood very near to them no doubt about 20 feet away may it not have been 10 feet no it was 20 feet or more in the open field no in the timber now timber is a timber forest what kind of timber beech timber leaves on it are rather thick in august says lincoln rather and you think this pistol was the one used it looks like it you could see the defendant shoot see how the barrel hung and all about it yes how near was this to the meeting place three quarters of a mile away where was where were the lights up by the minister stand three quarters of a mile away yes i've answered already Did you not see a candle there? Remember, this is when electricity was scarce. Did you not see a candle there with Lockwood or Grayson? No. 
What would we want a candle for? How then did you see the shooting? By moonlight, he said defiantly. So this is Lincoln now, cross-examining him in summary. So you saw the shooting at 10 at night in beech timber, three quarters of a mile from the lights, saw the pistol barrel, saw the man fire, saw it 20 feet away, saw it all by moonlight, saw it nearly a mile from the camp lights. Yes, I told you so before. The interest in the case was now so intense that men leaned forward to catch the smallest syllable. Then Lincoln drew out a blue covered almanac from his side coat pocket, opened it slowly, offered it in evidence, showed it to the jury, and the court read from a page. This is the important part. The court read from a page with careful deliberation that the moon on that night was unseen and only arose at one the next morning. So a, a false witness driven to saying that it, he saw it all by moonlight and the master stroke anticipated answer. An almanac showing the moon rose, this incident took place at 10 p.m. and it was one o'clock in the morning. Right? Now there's, a, there's an interesting end to this case. Following this climax, Lincoln moved the arrest of the perjured witness as a real murderer, saying nothing but a motive to clear himself could have induced him to swear away so falsely the life of one who never did him harm. And he brought a whole lot of other circumstances to show his testimony was false. With such determined emphasis, did Lincoln present his case that the court ordered Sovine, the eyewitness, arrested. And under the strain of excitement, he broke down and confessed to being the one who fired the fatal shot himself, but denied it was intentional. Now, that's a dream start for a young trial lawyer in a homicide case. But it is some very clever cross-examination, you have to admit. So the eyewitness dealing with him, you see, he dealt with him very politely, followed his story, accepted part of it, but kept getting answers, keeping him at a very far distance away from the scene of the and the light. So he, he emphasized far distance and poor light. And then when he finally came to moonlight, he pulled out his trump card, the almanac. Second. The expert witness. The expert witness is by definition an expert in his field. He's bound to be, unless he's a charlatan, more well-versed than the cross-examiner in his field of expertise. His evidence should be challenged only if it is in stark contrast to the most authoritative literature on the subject. And then again, if you're going to challenge medical evidence, please have a good counter expert in your favor. Keep him by the side if you have to in court. Consult him at all times when you make a question, when you pose a question. So you must keep a noted expert in the field to ensure that his evidence is fallacious and there is no escape route for him by which he can further or alternatively damage your client's case. You may, you, may, you may give him an exit route by which he can either further or in an alter alternative manner damage your client's case. Here's an interesting excerpt from the cross-examination of a medical expert in a case from New York and is one way to tackle a pompous doctor giving evidence. All right, so this was a personal injury case, really a personal injury case. It sounded in tort. It was only a case in tort, a personal injury case where the doctor had come to the witness box giving testimony about the nature of, and he had exaggerated the nature of injuries. So he deposed as to the nature of the injuries and he exaggerated. The brief summary of before the cross-examination, I will just read 
So you appreciate the cross-examination. Some experts, however, are mere shams and pretenders. This is from Wellman, by the way, the famous book on art of cross-examination. I remember witnessing some years ago, the utter collapse of one of the, these expert pretenders of the medical type. It was in a damaged suit. The plaintiff's doctor was a loquacious gentleman of considerable personal presence. He testified to a serious head injury and proceeded to lecture the jury on the subject in a sensational and oracular manner, which evidently made a great impression upon the jury. Even the judge seemed to give more than the usual attention. Uh, uh, attention. The doctor talked glibly about vasomotor nerves and reflexes and expressed himself almost entirely in medical terms which the ju jury did not understand. He polished off his testimony with the prediction that the plaintiff could never recover and if he lived at all, it would necessarily be within the precincts of an asylum. So that's how exaggerated his testimony was, but he embellished it with authority, he embellished it with vocabulary and he em embellished it with reputation. So it was then counsel's turn. Counsel kept the doctor and the, what follows was entirely on the advice of the doctor. Here's how you demolish a pompous doctor who's also a bit of a charlatan. You know your witness, you know your medical witness. Most of them, as I'll come to a little later, you must not touch because it'll harm you if they, if they, they're, they're better in their field, they know more. You, you know, just like they wouldn't argue with a lawyer in his field of expertise you ought to stay clear of him. Counsel, doctor, I infer from the number of books that you have brought here to substantiate your position and from your manner of testifying that you are very familiar with the literature of your profession and especially that part relating to head injury. Doctor says, I pride myself that I am, that I have, am, I have not only a large private library, but I spent many months in the libraries of Vienna, Berlin, Paris, and London. Then perhaps you are acquainted with Andrew's celebrated work on the recent and remote effects of head injury. Doctor smiling superciliously. Well, I should say I was. I had occasion to consult it only last week. Have you ever come across Shave on cerebral trauma, doctor? Yes, I have, I have read Dr. Shave's book from cover to cover many times. Counsel continued in much the same train, putting to the witness similar questions relating to many other fictitious medical works. So all these questions that were put were fictitious. Now, look, just like we've not read any law books and not heard of every law author, right? This was a tactic, right? This doctor, like anybody in his profession, had not heard of what counsel termed to be extremely famous treatises on head injuries, which was the subject matter of this case, right? So he gave a whole, the doctor having staked his reputation and his learning and his reading on the subject was averse, obviously, it was, a, it was a psychological tactic. He was averse to saying that he hadn't read, of, he hadn't read these books. On the contrary, he swallowed the bait and did it. Right? Finally, when counsel became clear, when it, beca when, became, when it became clear to counsel, until finally suspecting that the doctor was becoming conscious of the trap into which he was being led, counsel suddenly changed his tactic and demanded in a loud sneering tone, if the doctor had ever read page on injuries of the spine and spinal cord, a genuine and most learned treatise on the subject. To this, the doctor laughingly replied, I never heard of any such book and I guess you never did either. So just when you know your witnesses suspect is, is throwing you fictitious books. You throw him a genuine one, right? And he'll think, I'm not going to follow this trap anymore. And that's exactly what happened. So the climax had been reached. Dr. Hamilton, that's the defense lawyer, was immediately sworn for the defense and explained to the jury his participation in preparing the list of bogus medical works with which the learned expert, expert for the plaintiff had been shown in cross-examination. On the other hand, this is not really beware of doctors. You probably all heard of this episode. It's fictitious, but here's an, here's an example of why lawyers should stay away from cross-examining doctors. Do not cross swords with a medical man of repute 
because you might come on the wrong side of an exchange. Here's, a, here's, here's how the cross-examination goes. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? Have you heard this? Did you check for a pulse? Answer, no. Did you check for blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So it's possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? No. How can you be so sure, doctor? Because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar, says the doctor. But could the patient have been alive? The doc, very persistent counsel. But could the patient have been alive nevertheless? Yes, it is possible that he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. Yeah. So beware of dealing with doctors because you are likely to come a cropper with a really smart one and most of them will give you this kind of an answer. Unless he's a charlatan, please keep your safe distance, a safe social distance from doctors. The third kind of witness which you should approach with extreme caution is the police witness. An extract from Harris's hints on advocacy most aptly summarizes the hazards of cross-examining a police witness. Here's what he said. Of police persons, it is said, they are dangerous persons. They are professional witnesses. And in a sense that no other class of witnesses can be said to be so. Don't imagine that you can trip him upon the path where he has been for many a year. He will perceive you coming while you are a long way off and in all probability go out to meet you. Perhaps before you were born, he answered the question you just put. This is about the English police. In India, even more so. In India, there is a strong tendency on the part of the police to fabricate evidence, eyewitness accounts included, recovery evidence always, sometimes ballistic evidence. Things are planted. The parent of this tendency is the fact, and this is especially true in India, and this is something which requires acute remedial changes. The parent of this tendency to fabricate evidence is the fact that subordinate judges, the subordinate judiciary, as a rule, as a rule, think the police must be protected by an implicit belief in their veracity. There's almost an implicit belief that a police witness is always telling the truth. He has no motive to fabricate, but we know he does. Our trial experience tells us that the police very often concoct evidence to get the answer they want, to get the conviction they want, right? Now, this would be unheard of in any other civilized rule of law jurisdiction, but in India, it's tolerated, right? So long as you get an accused person who is probably the right person, but by concocted evidence, the court turns a blind eye to it. This is the practice in a sophisticated, evolved system of criminal law, which cannot be tolerated. There must be cases of perjury or of fabrication or forgery of evidence where the police resorts to such practice because whatever it is, you may not agree with the system, but the police think they've got the right man and he can do what he wants. But we have a system where fair play is the key. And this is not fair play. Sometimes it may result in horrible acquittals, but that is the risk of the system we have chosen to opt for ourselves by our constitution. So as a natural consequence of this extreme indulgence by the subordinate judiciary, the police fall into an error of believing in their own infallibility. The strongest reason therefore for handling with care police witnesses is that when challenged and exposed, they will go out of their way. I mean, I've seen this happen in so many cases. If you dare to challenge them, right? They will go out of their way and they can do it because they have a complete picture of the investigation. To damage your case wantonly, recklessly and wantonly, if you, if you, if you rub them the wrong way, they will go out of their way to damage you. 
comfortable in the knowledge for them that for them they are comfortable that for them there is no accountability for malafide investigations this does not mean however that a cross examiner must shy away from taking on a police officer who has fabricated evidence against his client but he must do so only when the evidence is strongly probative of such fabrication so if you have a good case go ahead otherwise you have to weigh the risks on balance should i sh should i take a risk of turning this man so hostile against me that although he's clearly fabricated this evidence right and he ought to be punished for it i ought to expose him for it right it'll add to my cross exam it'll be a feather in my cap it'll add to me my reputation as a as a cross examiner but your client comes first so do not go there because these are as i said wantonly reckless people when provoked they can really damage your case so tread again with extreme caution and they are very smart police officer very smart and here is one hilarious cross examination exchange where the police officer and this is a true this is a true story not not an exercise in hilarity like the last one with the doctor this is a true story a hilarious cross examination exchange when the police officer had the last word in his joust with defense attorney question officer did you see my client fleeing the scene no sir but i subsequently observed a person matching the description of the offender running several blocks away who provided this description officer the officer who responded to the scene question a fellow officer provided the description of this so called offender do you trust your fellow officers yes sir with my life question with your life you said let me ask you then this officer do you have a locker room in the police station a room where you change your clothes in preparation for your daily duties yes sir we do and do you have a locker in that room yes sir i do and do you have a lock on that locker yes sir i do so the the cross examiner thinks that he has triumphed now why is it officer he asks now why is it officer if you trust your fellow officers with your life that you find it necessary to lock your locker in a room you share with those same officers and here's the masterful answer of the police officer and why you must never mess around with them you see sir we share the building with a court complex and sometimes lawyers have been known to walk through the room with that the court room erupted in laughter and a prompt recess was called end of cross examination lawyer was silenced hence be very careful when you take on a police officer as you do men of expertise in their respective fields particularly doctors to sum up to sum up and there we hope open to questions a little more time than i expected to sum up as in sports so in the field of cross examination accomplishment and excellence demand herculean efforts perfect your technique by observing master craftsmen at work and then practice that technique as often in the courtroom yourself read your brief thoroughly and prepare your cross examination as if not just your clients life or fortune but your own depended upon it finally and this will come about slowly but surely with experience do not treat cross examination as an exercise in learning by rote or memory the best cross examiners i repeat the best cross examiners exhibit flexibility mental agility and a sterling capacity not merely to think on their feet but to make brilliant comebacks in the face of adverse evidence deposed to by formidable witnesses thank you very much
Thank you so much, sir. That was really uh, educative. It was, uh, of course, witty with all those stories that you've told us about uh, blunders made in cross-examination on so many occasions. Um, there are some questions that we have. I will request people also, if you want, you can put your videos on and put your hands up and I will unmute you all and also let you all address Mr. Jetmalani. But as we start, there is a question by um, our partner, Mr. Ashwin Shete. Um, I'll read out his question, sir. Um, so his question is, in a criminal trial, how fatal is it at the time of final hearing or an appeal to the defense if the, if the defense is not put up as suggestions to the prosecution witness? Well, that would depend on what the suggestion is, what, what evidentiary aspect the suggestion is not put. If it's, a, if it's an immaterial fact, it can't be fatal because nothing immaterial, no immaterial aspect of deposition can ever be said to be fatal. Therefore, if it's an immaterial fact, it's not fatal. But I dare say that if you do not, if you do not counter by suggestion, it is false when you said so and so on a very material fact which implicates you in the crime. Then, although the conviction may not rest solely on that fact, it is a very fatal omission on the part of cross-examining lawyer, which can be deemed to be an admission on that aspect. And if it's a case of circumstantial evidence, then that admission may tilt the scales against your client. Thank you, sir. Uh, second question comes from Seven Joseph. Uh, he asks, it is common knowledge that a lawyer should know when to stop asking a specific question. However, despite the lawyer stopping, sometimes a judge in guise of activism takes it upon himself to ask the witness further questions, which may prove fatal to the defense case. How to prevent this without coming across as rude or attracting potential contempt proceedings? Now, that's a very interesting question because uh, it, it, it impinges upon the question as to what is the role of a trial judge. Now, the two, the dichotomy is between, the dichotomy is between, is he an impartial observer like a referee in a sports game? Or does he have a greater role to play than that? example, i.e. of a referee? The answer clearly is, I mean, now it's not clear, but by judicial uh, uh, dictum, by judicial decisions, it is now laid down that the judge in a trial is not an idle spectator. We defense lawyers would love it when he didn't intervene, right? Because the faults in the prosecution case stand exposed by us. We've done all our homework, but a doughty judge, right, can enter the arena and ask him questions. Now, what I, what, what I really believe is that there must be some amendment here. The judge can do it, the judge can do it, not on a subsequent occasion. He should do it immediately, right? Because otherwise, if you do it on a later day, right, it should be on the same day of the cross-examination that the judge steps into the arena, right, and poses probing, probing questions, which perhaps gives the witness a chance to improve upon the effect of some searing cross-examination, right? But we've got to make it that it can't be done on a subsequent day when he has a chance of being pointed out, when he has an opportunity of being told, or the prosecutor has an opportunity of telling the witness, right? That you can't say this and at the first opportunity, change your mind, right? Or, or dilute it, say something to this effect, which negates the impact of the mistake you've made. So yes, a judge must do it promptly if he wants to step in, right? Particularly if he feels, particularly if he feels that the witness has deposed to that fact in favor of the defense, innocuously by mistake, and he didn't really mean it. And counsel has taken, defense counsel in his cross-examination has taken advantage of either the innocence of, of the uh, witness or the ambiguity of his question or some such thing. Then a judge was fully, right, uh, within 
his jurisdiction to come in, fill up that lacuna and rectify the wrong done. Thank you, sir. Um, next question is from um, uh, uh, some, someone whose name we don't have, but it says, sir, during cross-examination, our probable defense should be developed parallel from material on record before the court. Um, I think the question is that should we develop a parallel defense whilst we are cross-examining from the material on record? Well, yes, of course. I mean, that is part of, that is part of being flexible. That is part of being flexible. And as, as much as you will be surprising your opponent's witnesses, right? Your opponent's witnesses will come out with some fresh facts. I mean, they are not hidebound. They are not hidebound by the existing record. They can always add to it. You can demolish that by saying that it's not in the pleadings in a civil case, right? You can, you can object to it. In a criminal case, you can say that this is a vital omission and it's an improvement and therefore it should be ignored. It's, if it's, or it's an omission almost amounting to a contradiction and therefore its probative value is zero and it should be inadmissible. But while you can do that, it is always good because as I said at the outset, preparing your brief involves anticipating everything else that might be said, all responses, including the responses akin to a fresh case or fresh facts. Right? And those fresh case and fresh facts, sometimes you might not be able to anticipate. But when you get it, you should be quick on your feet and know how to deal with it. If you can't, if it is so, if it is so mind boggling and so difficult to deal with and so damaging to your client, then what you must do is seek an adjournment on say that this is fresh material. I need to consider it. It hasn't been said. And a, a fair judge will certainly give you that opportunity. Thank you, sir. The next two questions are a little interrelated. Um, it's the first is by our partner Pankaj Sutar, who asks, sometimes a witness Though, question is, though the question is straightforward or a closed question, volunteers and goes on saying things which may be fatal to the defense case. Any tactic to deal with such a witness? And a similar question asked by Vaseem Pangarkar, who also says, asks, how do we restrict a witness who keeps on making a voluntary comments or, or improvises his or her answer even after she's or he or she has answered the question? Well, the basic law, and it's very clear law, and judges who allow this kind of volunteering and allow witnesses to go on ad nauseum in their volunteering right, are not following the law. Cross-examination, generally, we are allowed to ask, in cross-examination, we are allowed to ask leading questions. We have a lot of latitude, right? The witness, generally, the law is on deposition. Generally, he must give you a yes or no answer. Unless the, unless the question is some which doesn't admit of a yes or no answer. He can volunteer facts relevant to the question. But the judge has a duty to curtail him when he's becoming irrelevant, vexatious, or obtuse. It is the judge's duty then to cut it down. And if the judge doesn't do it, many times the judge allows the witness to go on a frolic of his own. It is the judge's duty then, and if he doesn't listen to you, your objection, you must record it in writing. That all this was, uh, is irrelevant, should have been, and it is just extended the scope of the trial. The idea is that criminal trials, right, are to be curtailed. You can't go on ad nauseum introducing new facts. Thank you, sir. Um, a next, another question from uh, someone whose name we don't have, but the question is, what kind of different objections can be sought when the prosecution is examining a witness to protect the defense case? And is there, I'll just build, <clears throat> I'll build on that. Is there any, um, any kind of provision that we, that we can find on objections that can be taken um, so far as questions are concerned? Sir? Yes, I mean, the, 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 the constraints on the, are you talking about questions in cross-examination or in uh, evidence in chief? So I think or the are we, are we talking about civil matters? I'm talking about both uh, questions in uh, cross-examination as well as in chief, sir. But what in chief, objections? in cross-examination, the only 
the uh, and in chief in both types of uh, 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 proceedings the constraint is always of relevancy an objection can always be taken on the ground of relevance facts in issue as the evidence act says are what you can and relevant facts are what are the subject matter of a trial a trial judge will be failing in his duty if he doesn't do that the trial will be unnecessarily protracted the cross examination will be lengthy the rebuttals will be lengthy more and more witnesses will have to be called to demolish these new facts which are so absolutely necessary is relevance the other thing is frivolous questions scandalous questions these are all set out uh, in the evidence act from chapters 138 onwards what kind of questions can be asked questions as to credit there's a limited under 155 there's only a limited scope as to what kind of questions you can ask on the credit of a witness on his reputation you can you can for instance bring in previous convictions right but you can't get into his private life the judge won't permit that right even though it shows that he's a man of ill character right the the rationale of that being the the rationale of that being is that you don't want to turn you don't want to turn a trial into a mini trial on other side issues so that's the reason why you limit the scope of what can be asked in chief and cross examination and of course leading questions in evidence in chief can't be asked thank you sir um i have a question sir sometimes in cross examination you notice that the um you might not be able to establish that the witness is speaking a falsehood but the witness might not be accurate or be following the same line as they might have taken in their affidavit of examination in chief uh in that case also do you practically do you probe further or as soon as you've gotten a little bit of a contradiction is that sufficient or should you then have to probe that to make that contradiction into a falsity well the best way to deal yeah you've established that there's a contradiction between testimony and pleadings or testimony and previous statement right you've established that right but the the way to answer that right is to present him with a dilemma he is now between a rock and a hard place frozen i think so um we didn't get that are you still there hello yeah yeah i can get you sorry we didn't get um, i think we stopped we we stopped your audio stopped it he's in a between a rock and a hard place he is between a rock and a hard place because he is given two contradictory answers the best way to deal with him right is to say so you were given two different answers on oath either way he's perjured himself right the final question should be put him on the horns of this dilemma and say which of these two is correct and which is false so then he admits to a perjury in one event or the other so that would be the final nail in the coffin thank you sir um sorry there is a question from a gentleman who says can leading questions be asked in cross examination oh yeah uh, you have the utmost latitude in cross examination there is no restraint in cross examination the only restraint is relevance relevance scandal and uh, you know uh, questions which violate section 155 of the evidence act which is probing into personal life and so on and so forth even though it may be relevant those are not permitted thank you sir um sorry your junior gunjan wants to ask a question she's just typing it out in the meantime uh, uh can i ask it uh, uh, yeah, if you yes, allow please. me to yeah on video if possible uh so just a question that if certain material is left out uh, which is there in the statement of the witness but uh, it's not covered in the examination in chief for some odd reason which is beneficial to the defense uh, then should the cross cross examiner ask that by way of a 
omission or should you be first asking direct questions uh, get an answer in your favor and then point out if there is any contradiction no so that you what you're saying is where there is material against your client in the previous police statement of a witness but it's not brought on record by the prosecution no material in favor of the accused favor of the accused yeah yeah yes. and not bought by the prosecution in the examination in chief oh then you must bring it out and then so should that be a direct questioning uh, line of questioning or should that be by way of uh, uh, stating omissions in the statement so first you tell him you you tell him this you first put it to him you first put it as a matter of fact let's say that he said that i saw your client in a place which affords him an alibi for example right right but he doesn't depose to it in his testimony in court right. then you say so and so mr so and so the question will be posed mr so and so did you see my client at so and so in such and such a time right if he okay. denies it then use his previous statement under 145 to contradict and him. contradict him contradict okay him. Okay. okay okay thank you so there is a question from wasim pandarkar from mzm legal who asks can you explain the concept of chain of custody in evidence chain of custody yes sir that's but that really i think the chain of custody concept comes uh, uh, when when the police is in is in custody of vital material like say in a narcotics case narcotics case right there's got to be a certain uh, procedure for testing sealing and sending onward to the uh, for for seizing packaging sealing and then sending it uh, to the forensic laboratory for testing getting it back in a pristine state uh, not tampered with so the chain of custody i think refers to the the integrity and sanctity of vital evidentiary material be it narcotics be it a weapon of offense be it a cartridge be it blood stained clothes i think that's what he means by chain of custody so what is the question pertaining to chain of custody if we get some more clarity i'll i'll come back to the question but the in the chain meantime, of custody refers to this aspect that the, the 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 entire procedure from seizure to trial must reflect that this vital material has been free from any blemish and the procedure is an integral one there's no way you can question the integrity of the preservation of that vital material from seizure to trial production in trial thank you sir the next question is from santosh abhar who says is there a difference between cross examination and direct examination no no the, the there are in uh, under the indian evidence act there is only evidence in chief cross examination and re examination then if you recall a witness right there is a further cross examination then you can further cross examine a witness or if a court witness if a, if a court examines somebody you cross examine him but direct evidence direct cross examination uh, direct examination doesn't mean anything unless unless we are bringing in the the uh, dichotomy between virtual and real proceedings so right now we are having an indirect conversation when it becomes real is direct so also i suppose cross examination uh, in court is direct and on video conferencing it will be indirect over to i don't know what that means i don't know what the phrase but there is no phrase known to anglo american indian jurisprudence known as uh, direct examination thank you sir the next question is from our partner abhay dhariwal he says that uh, if contrary statements are made in the statement of fact do we cross examine the witness on the contradiction or draw reference because if we ask a question he may try to improvise his version and if not it will be treated as an admission no if so what you must do is if he said something which is in the case of a contradiction if a witness has deposed something contradictory in his court testimony 
qua his pleadings in a civil case or his previous statement in a police case you must just bring the contradiction on record in a manner which is consistent with section 145 that's all right if you want to if if you want to uh, put the final nail in the coffin as i said earlier right if there are two statements on oath you can tell him which one is true or not but in the case of a police statement it's always open to a a, a, a witness to say i never said this to the police and that's one of the one of the uh, uh, flaws in the criminal procedure code which leads to hostile witnesses as well and which needs to be remedied your statements by virtue of one section 162 of the criminal procedure code can't be signed you can't sign witness statements now i think that gives that that is a bad practice from both the prosecution's point of view and the defense's point of view because because witness statements are not signed because witness statements are not signed you're getting this prol proliferation of hostile witnesses because there's nothing to bind them all they say is that i never said when when a when a prosecutor cross examines a hostile witness the witness turns around and says i never said it to the police then then the prosecution or the defense depending on who wants to bring the omission out has to rely upon the police officer to come and say that i did record his statement right so this is an extremely cumbersome procedure and i i do not know the rationale i do not know the rationale for why this was ever introduced in indian law that police statement should not be signed if i have anything to do with this reform i am certainly going to make sure that 162 statement should be signed because it's a clarion call for subversion of justice you are allowing witnesses to get out the rationale for not letting witness statements witness police statements be signed in a, in a uh, uh, during investigation is that the police often uh, get concocted statements but the answer to that the answer to that is that the um, the man who is made to sign a statement right the moment he comes out should say during investigation that i never signed the statement the present position is that by saying that 162 statement should not be signed because these statements are fabricated by the police and they will they will force a witness to sign a statement right the 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 abuse of that is witnesses are now being are selling themselves and turning hostile look at the kind of travesty of justice that's happening so many cases so many murder cases capital offenses have failed because of this 162 provision you can't bind a witness to his previous signed statement because he's not obliged to sign it by 162 so convictions are going astray courts are now interfering by saying that even the even in the case of a hostile witness you can salvage some part of his evidence so you have a tortuous exercise of saying what is true and what is what are basically you're leaving it entirely to the court, to the trial judge which part of a hostile witness's evidence right can be salvaged and why rather than that just make him sign his 162 statement thank you sir uh, on that note i would just like to inform all the viewers um something that you mentioned in in your answer uh, mr dipalan is appointed on a committee Uh, looking into the reforms to the criminal procedure code uh, this is a committee of five gentlemen along with mr jalani and uh, been appointed so, um, what provisions of the criminal procedure code and the criminal law need reforms uh, so that we move forward to a more uh, better society or better criminal justice delivery system so just wanted to to tell our viewers that sir um any anyone else on questions is there anyone uh, who has any questions could put your hands up so i think we have there is uh, of course um, just as an aside someone uh, wanted to ask you that um, just give me a moment sir so there is a, a radhika who asks as intellectual capacity varies per person and a degree is only the beginning of a journey of a lawyer this is of course not related to our topic but i think she's a student who's just graduated what do you think of students getting a law degree before the set age or before time against a set process of 3 year llb or 5 year llb course as is prescribed by the respective state uh, government or the bar council of india well you know i i don't want uh, we have a very trigger happy chairman of the bar council of india so i don't want to say anything and then 
he comes out and he you know he's now the in the in 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 delhi the supreme court bar association and the bar council of india chairman are at loggerheads i do not for one minute want to enter this arena and say anything but qualifications i have to say qualifications for the bar council of india which which are prescribed by the bar council of india they are mandatory and they should be observed having said that you know the nature of your degree really uh, is no uh, is no future guide uh, as to how you're going to perform when you get into your career right uh, uh, to take an example from home my father qualified uh, prematurely at the age of 18 and he had to fight his own case his first case which he fought was a case in which he fought for his right to practice at before the age prescribed by the bar council of karachi at that time so he fought and he won that case so you know uh, ultimately it's your industry and your and your and your your experience and your flair uh, degrees you know there was a famous graffiti in a university i attended in england right it said education kills by degrees so uh, I, you know i'm not a great I'm, i'm not greatly impressed with the ta- number of years spent if if you have a curtailed education in law right when you're at university you can always make it up when you're a practitioner you can learn on the job but the bar council has prescribed mandatory rules and times for uh, the amount of years for which you have to be so those must be you know strictly adhered to thank you so we'll take the last two questions one is uh, the first one is uh, by someone who's asked what are the limitations or cautions that should be practiced in cross examination when a wit- when the witness is the victim stroke complainant and the only witness to the crime i mean in this case you have no caution uh, you have no uh, scope for caution at all there's a single witness right examine his evidence in chief if his evidence in chief uh, is of strong probative value and it implicates you then throw all caution to the winds and be a terrier uh, not a terror be a terrier in your cross examination and demolish him he is the only witness against you and you have to demolish him you have but no choice there is no alternative here the man has to be tra- not just dealt with the utmost uh, fury but you have to bring all your prowess to bear and demolish him and what he said in court um the second question is uh, by another person who asks and i will just build on that question also in the end uh, it says that in the event when perjury has been committed in a cross examination by a witness what action can be taken against such witness and if i may just build on this question to say that if a witness makes even the slightest contradiction um, would it amount to perjury or even if a witness gives one false answer does it amount to perjury sir or does it have to be false testimony in its entirety no no no, no. if you if you if you make a statement on oath during the course of your deposition on a material fact on a material fact if you make an innocuous false statement right i mean if it's not material what the name of your wife is and you and you <laughs> that's you, most material sir <laughs> forget your wife's name on that particular day right <laughs> then that is not a material then that is not material at all that is not material at all and it doesn't invite perjury however if you make a material false which damages your opponent right your clients your the your, your, your client of your opponent then certainly uh, it's going to uh, invite perjury but mind you the law on perjury is that the nature the, the statement which is which constitutes perjury has to be crystal clear as perjury any ambiguity in that statement right if there's anything in the judge's mind which says you know this may be a mistake this is not strictly perjury let's give him back. if there is doubt for that perjury will not even be invoked by the by the uh, judge deciding the issue right in any event perjury is the overarching like contempt the overarching rationale for perjury is that it must promote the administration of justice so you always have a clause unfortunately and frankly this is unfortunate because in so many i tell you litigation in this country would stop if there were just one judge bold enough you can't you can't actually blame the judges because they are so time constrained 
that now you entered into a side wind of a perjury proceeding, right? Uh, you know, becomes difficult for them. There's such a crushing burden of litigation anyway. But if perjury, if we had more judges, if there were not so many areas, then perjury proceedings would advance the cause of speedy justice. Right now, the irony is that by uh, the perjury proceedings are so cumbersome themselves. You remember you have section 340 of the criminal procedure code, which in itself is a tortuous procedure, right? It's now being considered, 340 is now moot before I think the Supreme Court, if I'm not mistaken, 340 in perjury proceedings, whether that whole procedure has to be gone through to actually initiate a perjury prosecution by a court. But it is so tortuous that it, it's counterproductive. Perjury which, perjury, which should be a deterrent from false pleadings and false testimony, now itself is not resorted to because of the pressure of the actual list itself in which the perjury has been committed. Right, right. Thank you. So, and um, there is a last question from uh, the, the, the very eager student Radhika who asks that if we had to take you back into a time machine, this is the last question, so we'll take. Uh, it says that if we have to take you back into a time machine and if law was not a choice, what would you have chosen as your career or profession, sir? I, you know, when I was in school, I was so much in awe of my father and I'd attended so many of his cases, even as a student, right? I, I mean, I, I just loved that. You know, I'd attended trials, murder trials and so on and so forth. I'd gone to the districts here when I was in school, when I came back from university. That for me, you know, most kids would say, you know, I want to be a soldier or a pilot or an engineer or something like that, right? Something glamorous. Pilots were very glamorous in those days, you know, just like aerostices were very glamorous in those days. <laughs> but it, to be an aerostice was, a, you know, was a pick of the job for most women in those days. But I used to always say lawyer. I always said I want to be a lawyer because it, it was, a, and I'm fourth generation. So I kind of felt, you know, in India, we are so hereditary about everything. I kind of felt, but my kids, my kids see me working and they say no way law. So perhaps the generation ends with me, the fourth one. <laughs> Thank you, sir. On that note, uh, I would like to thank uh, thank you, and I would uh, request Mr. Jaikar to uh, make the closing address. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. I, I think more than the juniors whom you were proposing to address this uh, session, I think it's us seniors who have learned a lot, especially when our firm is into cross-examination. With due respects, we don't brief counsel. So for all my partners and my juniors, it's a life, it's an eye-opening experience. It's fantastic. I can't tell you how thankful I am to you, Mahesh. And my only thing would be, I would request you, Mahesh, if you can give us a few more talks, let Archit coordinate with you, if that is okay with you. Because more than anything, and we have seen that all our juniors who are otherwise very lax in getting onto the computer have realized that they are all out because the maximum participation was 100. And I see around 20% are our juniors. The rest of them are probably watching it on YouTube. So may we request you, Mahesh, we've got this sort of a fantastic, fantastic response. If you can give us another uh, lecture of this type on uh, criminal law, it would help us a hell of a lot. Thank you very much. I must Anytime. also tell you, Mahesh, I must also tell you, you have made references to your father. You said you would be partisan if you referred to him. Well, let me tell every participant here, I was lucky enough to be instructing as the main solicitor when I was in an earlier firm in a trial in the Mumbai High Court before the High Court, which ran for 62 days. And Mr. Ram Jitmalani was leading that matter. And I have seen his cross. Apart from the cross, I have seen him after the matter, we had one hour and we had to go for a conference. And the next morning, we had to be at the conference at eight o'clock when he would be there after and played his badminton. And it used to be, I mean, it was a learning experience for a young solicitor at that time, which got me so much into the fact that we don't, we should do this all on our own. Why can't we argue? If we have the gift of the gab, if we have the knowledge, if we have the ability, let's do it. And let me be very, very honest with you. Your father, 
and after him, Mr. Bahanwati, have been two inspirations to me to say, appear in the matter. Appear yourself as much as you can. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So you not only have a pedigree behind you, but you are, your father has left a distinctive, adoptive pedigree amongst all of us, at least in me. So, so sweet of you, Mohan. That's why I, mean, I, 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 I love you. this profession. I, I love this profession because, because you make such good friends and such good bonds always, you know. It's a, 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 Honestly. And I cherish our relationship with you. I cherish the firm's contacts with you. And we are surely going to request you for some more lectures, please. Thank it you so very much. much. As I was telling Mohan, as I was telling Archit, you know, we have no choice. Wine bars are out now, so we have to do webinars. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all the participants who have been here. I see some extensive interactive participation and also how soon everybody has gotten. Thank you very, very much. It's one of the best lectures that I've had conducted by the firm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. Thank you, Mohan. Thank thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Archit. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.